now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. I need to make sure I make this very clear. Predominantly, the Whistler program through the majority of its run was only a West Coast program, only aired where signal gasoline was sold, which was primarily the Pacific Coast states, and also Nevada, and I think a couple of other uh, states as well. But that's why the Whistler, for the bulk of its run, was only heard in the Western United States. And thank goodness we can bring it to you now, because a lot of these shows are good, and they're spooky. This episode, February 19th, 1950, The Whistler and the Five Cent Call. And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who's guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler... Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. For extra driving pleasure, the signal to look for is the yellow and black circle sign that identifies signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And for Sunday evening listening pleasure, the signal to listen for is this whistle that identifies the signal oil program, The Whistler. the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, for the Signal Oil Company, the whistler's strange story, Five Cent Call. It began simply with a telephone call. A five-cent call. Private investigator Scott Howell made his report to attorney Rick Parker. It was routine enough, at least when the conversation began. And Scott had felt when he dialed Rick's number that his assignment would be complete. Mission completed. Rick seemed to agree. Seemed pleased at Scott's first words into the phone. It's all taken care of, Rick. I rented the cottage about an hour ago. Uh. Scott. Hey, I'll give you the address. 942 Ryder Street. Hmm. Not a house near it. 942 Ryder Street. Yeah, sounds good, Scott. Yeah, I think this witness you want to hide will like it. There'll be no question. She can stay there on ice till you need her for trial. Fine. Anything else, boss man? Oh, no. No, no. Yeah, yeah. Just this. Forget you ever worked on this. You're all paid. Yeah, very well paid. Oh, just a minute, Scott. Someone's at the door. Oh, sure. <clears throat> If you think you can get away with one, wait a minute. I didn't come here to argue. Listen to me, listen to me. Rick! Rick, can you hear me? Anne. Anne. Rick! Operator. Operator. Operator? Give me the police. Right away, it's an emergency. You can't understand it, can you, Scott? The strange, violent scene that must have taken place at Rick Parker's apartment. You thought it was a lover's quarrel, just an exchange of words. But now you're certain it was something else, and you waste no time in contacting the police. Twenty minutes later, you're facing a man you've talked to before. Lieutenant Perez of Homicide. He's quiet, but gently insistent, isn't he, Scott? A man you wouldn't want to go up against. But he does seem satisfied with almost everything that you tell him. 
Yeah, that's all then, Scott. You phoned your client, Rick Parker, made your report. Yeah, that's right. Then he excused himself for a moment, stepped away from the telephone. Right, and then, and then I heard the voice. An argument. With some woman. Yeah, that's it. Well, that's all I know, Lieutenant Perez. You, uh, didn't hear any mention of the woman's name? Name? Uh, why, no. No, I didn't. Rick just kind of well, breathed into the phone, but he didn't answer when I called him. All right, thank you, Scott. Uh, for the call and the cooperation. Good night. Good night, Lieutenant. You wonder why you didn't mention Anne to Lieutenant Perez. But it's a part of your trade as a private investigator not to tell everything to anyone. Besides, you sense that you're on to something and you wonder who the name belongs to. This mysterious Anne. The answer comes the following day in the newspapers. Simple enough, Scott. Rick Parker was once married to a showgirl. Her name, Anne. The same Anne who was now married to a very prominent doctor. You smile as you read about it. Tell yourself that you and Anne must have a little talk. The next day, you find the address and go there. Yes? Oh, hello. I, uh, I suppose you're Anne. I don't believe that we've ever met. Uh, no, we haven't met. Howell's the name, Scott Howell. Private investigator. Errand boy, messenger. Sorry, Mr. Howell, I've no errands to be run today. Uh-huh. And you can take your foot out of the door or I'll call my husband. Oh, uh, he's not in. How did you... And please, please, you think a thoroughly schooled and practicing private eye would make that mistake? What mistake? The one I want to discuss with you. What you were doing in another man's apartment last night. Now, would I discuss such a situation in front of your husband? <laughs> I happen to know Dr. Farrell's out of town. Who are you? I told you. Never I... mind. Come in. Oh, that's better. Yeah. That's much better. Easier on the shoes. I'll, uh, I'll take water with my scotch, if you don't mind. I'm not getting you a drink. And you're not staying here long. Just long enough to, to tell... tell you exactly what I mean. Yes. You're in trouble, Anne. Because of... What happened to Rick Parker? Mm-hmm. I divorced him several years ago. I haven't seen him. I wasn't in his apartment. No. He spoke your name, baby, on the telephone. Telephone? Yeah, we were talking, Rick and I. He put the phone aside when you walked in. I heard the quarrel, the shots. And I heard him say your name. His last words. Anne. Anne. Well. I have nothing to say. Ah, suit yourself. For now, I mean. I'll give you until tomorrow to think about it. Or? Or I go to the cops. Why, what are you mixing in for? Oh, please, Anne. Rick Parker was a client of mine and paid me well, very well, for little jobs now and then. I lose some revenue, my bread and butter. Is that what you want? Well, <laughs> not exactly bread and butter, no. Now, I'll take that drink No. And, uh, okay, okay. You don't want to be chummy, huh? <laughs> All right, I'll go quietly. And stay quiet if you'll send me $5,000 by tomorrow night. Oh, you'll find me in the phone book. Get over, Ann. Cheap, I'd say. You certainly are. You said you'd let me think about this. I think better alone, Mr. Howell. Do you mind? No, no, I can take a hint. But I'll be waiting. And none too patiently. Not too patiently at all. You wonder about Ann all that night, don't you, Scott? Because she doesn't seem to frighten very easily. Yes, Scott. You wonder a great deal about Anne and what she will do. But you have your answer the following evening when you arrive home. And there's an envelope in your mailbox addressed in a feminine hand. You open it, check the contents, and grin broadly. Five thousand. <laughs> Hello, Scott. Uh, oh. Oh, Lieutenant Perez, what's on your mind? I oh, just wanted to check a few more points on the Parker case. I missed you at your office. Yeah, yeah, I left early. I was wondering about that telephone call, Scott. How long would you say you and Rick Parker talked? Oh, maybe a minute at the most. And up until you heard that other voice, Parker seemed normal, not upset about anything? Hmm, that's right. I just wondered. All right, thank you, Scott. Not at all. Well, hmm? so you got a letter. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I belong to the Lonely Hearts Club, Lieutenant. Mm-hmm. And she loves you? Oh, she's crazy about me. We'll be exchanging pictures soon. That should put an end to it. Yeah. You're cute, too. <laughs> Think so, Scott? Maybe you should send her my picture. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Well, Scott, the payoff has begun, hasn't it? Five thousand dollars in cash from Anne. And in the weeks that follow, it all falls into a familiar and lucrative pattern. You call on Anne again and again. And after each visit, the envelopes arrive with uh, additional payments. It's going beautifully, isn't it? Until one evening when the expected payment is not in the mailbox. And an hour later, someone knocks on the door of your Yeah? Uh, That's right, Mr. Howell. You shouldn't have come here. We'll talk inside, if you don't mind. Mind? It's a pleasure. I'll get right to it, Mr. Howell. Scott, your little game of blackmail is all over. Oh? Have you seen tonight's papers? Uh, well, just the funny. I hope you enjoyed them, because this isn't so funny. You see, the police are on the trail of a woman, Nora Ralston. She was seen leaving Rick's apartment. They say she had something to do with a case he was working on. Really? They're certain she killed Rick, and they expect to have her in custody by tomorrow. That changes my position, Scott. I'm no longer a possible suspect. Keep talking. Gladly. There isn't much to say. Just what I'll... I'll tell the police when... If... They ask me. And that is? Why I was in Rick's apartment at the time he was shot. You see, he was bothering me. Rick didn't seem to get the idea that an ex-husband is no more than that. Couldn't believe I really love the man I'm married to now. Yeah, well, I hope it's love with him, baby. He might not like the idea of where you were when he was out of town. I think he'll understand when I tell him why I did it. To protect him, his professional reputation. Like Caesar's wife. A doctor's wife must also be above suspicion. Yeah, but you're not. I told you, Rick called your name into the phone. I heard him. And? Certainly you did. When this girl came there, I hid in the other room. That's why I didn't see her. Rick was calling to me after she shot him. He was calling for help. Wait a minute. It's the truth, Scott. And the police will believe me, especially when they've arrested her. They'll believe me. Not you. Yeah, well, what about your husband? That bad publicity. If you go to the police, the newspapers the will have... The police will keep my name out of it, I'm sure. They'll be just as anxious to protect my husband's name as I was. And they'll be quite pleased to rid society of another blackmailer. I guess you win. Look. Look, I'll give you 5000 now, and in a couple of months that I'll give you some... That won't do. Mo- you only gave me one day. But I'll give you until the end of the week to return all of it. The whole 15000 But there's no place I can... That's get- too bad. Now that the shoe's on the other foot, it pinches. Doesn't it, Scott? Plenty. I'm sure it does. Remember... If you don't repay every cent by the end of the week, I go to the police and you go to prison. February 19th, 1950, The Whistler on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Are you suffering with arthritis or osteoporosis? Do you have diabetes? Did you know that these are just two of the hundreds of diseases that have seen improvement with Dr. Wallach's incredible longevity products? You can't get them at a health food store. The only way to get them is to call us at 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Do you have heart disease, fibromyalgia, or high blood pressure? Do you have a terrible time losing weight? Dr. Wallach can help. He was a veterinarian and cured diseases in animals. He felt that he could do the same for humans, so he became a physician. Over 50 years of research and helping people like you goes into every bottle of Dr. Wallach's amazing discoveries. Do you want to feel better? Learn how to treat the cause of your problem rather than covering up the symptoms with drugs. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. 
0065. Thanks for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox here on your favorite station. Now more of The Whistler and the Five Cent Call from February 19th, 1950. sudden change of events, the tables have turned, haven't they? Your hold over Anne, Rick Parker's former wife, is wiped away. And she's insisting on the return of the money you've managed to take from her. You're going to have trouble returning Anne's money, because you've spent a great deal of it. And then suddenly your thoughts turn to Nora, Nora Ralston, the woman the police are looking for. And as you think about her, a plan begins to take shape in your mind. Yes. But before you can make a move, you've got to find her. In the days that follow, you use every trick you've ever known, checking every angle carefully. Finally, from Rick's former switchboard operator, you get what seems like a good lead. Late that evening, you return to your office and make a phone call. Hello? Hello, Nora. I'm sorry, you the wrong... Hold it, sweetheart. This is Scott Howell. Still there? Yes. Guess you read about it in the papers, huh? I was talking to Rick when he was killed. Overheard him quarreling with his killer. I, uh, I read about it. I, uh, didn't tell the police what I overheard. That is not all of it. Well, we talk it over? Where are you now? At the office. I'll meet you wherever you say. Golden Gate Park in an hour, back of the museum. Okay. I'll be driving a green convertible. It's a break, isn't it, Scott? After days of searching for Nora Ralston, you finally found her. And now you've an appointment to meet her. It's the chance that you've been waiting for. As you drive your convertible up Gary Street, you tell yourself you'll have to move with caution in dealing with Nora Ralston. A dangerous woman, isn't she, Scott? She's already killed one man. And now, hounded by the police, there's no telling what she'll do. A few minutes before eight, you drive into the park find Nora waiting for you back at the museum alone. As she slides into the seat next to you, a gun suddenly appears in her hand. Just keep driving, Scott. What's the idea? The idea is I don't trust you. Oh, now look, baby. You wanted to talk, didn't you? All right. Drive out to the beach. We'll talk. How about putting that gun away, sweetheart? All right. But first drop yours on the floor. Oh, sure, sure. Mm. There you are. But let me warn you, if you have any ideas about leaving me face down in a ditch along the road, you better forget them. I took certain precautions. Such as? A letter, for one thing. If anything happens to me, it'll wind up in the hands of the police. It'll be a cinch for the gas chamber, baby. When you reported the murder to the police... Why didn't you tell them then what you'd overheard? Well, I figured it was a little too choice to pass on. <laughs> Maybe I could use some of it at a later date. Like now. <laughs> a shakedown. That's what I thought. Call it anything you like. But I've got to have 10,000 bucks or I talk to the DA. 10,000? It's worth every cent of it. Listen, sweetheart, the cops don't have a thing on you. Sure, you were seen leaving Rick's apartment. But that doesn't prove you killed him. That's right, it doesn't. Well, then why did you run? Obvious, isn't it? Yeah. Because <laughs> you didn't know what I'd do. You didn't know whether I'd open up or not. See how important I am to you, baby? I could cinch this case against you. You are very important to me, Scott. I don't even have enough cash to get me out of town as far as I want to go. How about your jewelry? I know you've got quite a bit. Rick was generous, real generous. Yes, Rick was generous. I still have every piece of jewelry he gave me. It's worth at least... Fifteen two. grand. I know. I got the stuff for him. It was hot, wasn't it? Well, not exactly, no. It was just sort of simmering. So you won't have much trouble getting rid of it? No trouble at all. Should bring around ten thousand. Ten thousand? Mm-hmm. Good. I was counting on your help. That's why I agreed to meet you. Help? What do you mean? I've got news for you, Scott. You're not going to blackmail me. 
But I'm willing to make a deal. Convert my jewelry into cash, and I'll uh, split it with you. Split it? Oh, no. I need the whole 10,000. Don't be silly. I'll need at least five to get as far away from here as possible. You you don't want the police to catch up to me, do you? Why should I care if they do? <laughs> Look, pal, I happen to know a lot about you, those deals with Rick. So what? For a smart lawyer, Rick talked too much. He told me about the deals the two of you pulled on some of his clients. That old man in Mill Valley, for instance, the will he left. $50,000 to Rick. A forgery scar. You had it done. You got a nice cut out of it. Now, wait a minute. Wait. There were other deals, too. I could tell the DA all about them. An investigation could send you to San Quentin for uh, 30 years. So, you see, you just can't afford to have me picked up by the police now, can you? No, I guess I can't. I'm being very generous, you know, giving you half the money, but then I need your help. And I'm willing to pay for it. Now, look, I've got to have 10000 No, budget. Scott. Five. That's all. For that, you help me get out of town, and you'll keep your mouth shut. All right. Where's the jewelry? Drive me back to town. I'll pick it up and call you at your office, say, uh, around 10. The conclusion of The Whistler and the Five Cent Call from February 19, 1950, comes up following these words from your favorite station. I'm Wyatt Cox. This is Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. No offense, but are you a little fat when you look in the mirror? How would you like to learn the secrets to lose three to five pounds a week easily without joining the gym or going through any crazy diets? It's called Body Sculpt by Med Diet. For the last two decades, we've been helping people just like you that have pounds they want to shed. We've helped millions of people lose thousands and thousands of pounds over the years. And now it's your turn. Learn the secrets of how to lose weight with one simple phone call. You'll see an amazing difference in a matter of days. Don't believe us. We'll offer you a money-back guarantee. If you're ready to start losing weight right now, call right now to learn more about your risk-free order to Body Sculpt. Call for your risk-free offer. 800-738-5332. That's 800-738-5332. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of The Whistler and the Five Cent Call from February 19th, 1950. You made up your mind instantly, didn't you, Scott? When Nora refused to give you more than $5,000, you knew exactly what you had to do. You need the 10000 to repay Ann Farrell, and that means you have to double-cross Nora more than that silence her forever, because you can't take the chance of having her picked up by the police and talking. You're sitting at your desk waiting for Nora's call when a few minutes before ten, you have an unexpected visitor. Hello, Scott. Oh, Lieutenant Perez. Mind if I come in? Uh, Well, I was just about ready to close up shop. What can I do for you? What do you know about Nora Ralston? What makes you think I know anything about her? I was just wondering. You were working for Rick Parker. Sure. He knew Nora Ralston quite well, I understand. Yes, I read in the papers. Rick ever talked to you about her? No. We never discussed his private life. And Nora was his private life. Oh, excuse me. Hello? Scott? Yeah. Uh, Oh, it's Mrs. Ansley. Nora. Yeah, I know. You're not alone? Uh, No. Police? That's right. Uh, nothing to get alarmed about. <clears throat> Everything's going swell. Can you meet me? Of course, Mrs. Ansley. I'll be at the corner of Divisadero and Jackson in half an hour. Right. Be sure you're not followed. Don't worry, Mrs. Ansley. I won't be. Bye. That was a client, Lieutenant. Nice old lady from Philly. Well, as I was sure, saying... Sure, sure, sure. I'll be running along. Yeah, I'll walk out with you, Lieutenant. In the street, you watch Lieutenant Perez until he's out of sight. Then quickly you get into your car and drive into the mission district. From time to time, you glance at your rearview mirror and finally swing across Market Street and up Fillmore. And then certain you're not being followed, you turn into Jackson Street. 
pull up at the corner of Divisadero. Get in, Nora. You're late. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't being tailed. What's the suitcase for? Moving? You found me, didn't you? I thought it would be a smart idea to get out before the police did. Well, your troubles are over. Hmm? What do you mean? That little hideout Rick asked me to find. Oh. 942 Ryder Street. Rent's paid for a couple of months. Nice, quiet neighborhood. <laughs> You'll be quite safe there, baby. Until I can sell you jewelry. We'll drive over there now. Oh, by the way, got the jewelry with you? In the suitcase. Oh, fine. You're not going to try anything, are you, Scott? You're going to play it smart. Oh, very smart. You better. Or I'll make an awful lot of trouble for you. Yeah, I know, sweetheart. I know. Yes, you're well aware of that fact, aren't you, Scott? And as you drive up the road to 942 Ryder Street, you realize there's one thing you could do to pay back the money you owe Ann Farrell and prevent Nora from falling into the hands of the police and telling them all that she knows about you. Finally, you reach your destination. Bring the key out of your pocket. Open the back door of the cottage you'd rented for Rick Parker. Suddenly, as Nora walks past you, you reach out and grab her purse. Give me that. I want that gun of yours, baby. There we are. Yeah, it's better. What's the idea? Obvious, isn't it? Oh, no, you... You wouldn't kill me, Scott. Of course not. You're going to commit suicide. With your own gun. No, Scott, you wouldn't do that. I, I know you wouldn't. That just goes to show how wrong a dame can be, sweetheart. It's over, isn't it, Scott? Nora Ralston is dead. The police will find her body in the cottage in the remote little hideout, a suicide. The murder weapon, the same gun she used to kill Rick, will be in her hand, and the case will be closed. In a few days, you'll dispose of her jewelry quietly through your contacts. And you'll have enough money to pay Ann Farrell every cent you owe her. Keep her from going to the police, telling them that you were blackmailing her. Now you pick up Nora's body... Place it in a chair. And then as you're about to put the gun in her hand, you hear the door open behind you. Uh, Suddenly the lights go on. Hello, Scott. Lieutenant. Yeah, drop the gun. Oh. Nora Ralston. Oh, well. Now look, Lieutenant Perez, Say I can it tell you... Scott. You know, we've been waiting for a long time for someone to show up here. Didn't expect you, though. What do you mean, waiting over? We've had this place watched since the night Rick Parker was killed. You've been watching this? Wait a minute, that can't be. How did you... How did we know about it? Simple. The night Rick was murdered, we found an address on his telephone pad. This address. It's your own fault, Scott. You should have realized when you give an address to someone over the phone, they usually write it down on the phone pad. will be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil, and fine automotive accessories. Featured in tonight's story were Gerald Moore, Virginia Gregg, and Betty Lou Gerson. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Adrian Jean Doe, music by Wilbur Hatch and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. February 19th, 1950, The Whistler on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Are you in bad pain? You know what I mean. Your knees hurt. Your shoulder hurts. Your elbow and back are constantly killing you. And I'm sure you've tried every pain pill or cream available at the drugstore. Am I right? Well, here's something you haven't tried. 
Pain Magic. Pain Magic is not available at any drugstore. The only place you can get it is by calling the special toll-free number I'm about to give you. And to make things even better, call right now and find out about our buy one, get one free offer. We're so confident it'll work for you that we offer a free bottle with your purchase. No prescription required. Call now to learn how you can get Pain Magic and get rid of your pain. Remember, your results may vary. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. 800-492-8164. That's 800-492-8164. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, an episode of Captain Midnight from February 19th, 1940. The Skelly Oil Company presents Captain Midnight. Captain Midnight, brought to you three times each week by the Skelly Oil Company, Skelly Joppers and Dealers. And now to Captain Midnight. The last time you remember, Chuck Ramsey and his young friend, Frank Crane, accidentally walked into Ivan Shark's disguised plane hiding in an out-of-the-way field, not knowing that Shark was hiding inside. Shark then took off with both Chuck and Frank. Hours later, Captain Midnight landed at the Ridgeville Airport and was told of Chuck's disappearance. In our scene today, Captain Midnight and Steve Donovan are in the office of Mr. Maxwell, manager of the visiting plane hangar, discussing plans for tracing Chuck. Let's listen as Steve asks. This search may take days, Captain Midnight. What are we going to do with Ma and Patsy and the others in the meantime? Well, we'll get hotel accommodations for Mrs. Donovan and Patsy. Pinky Drake and Slim Fool and young Pablo can stay out here at the field. Well, sure, they can book in the pilot's room. How many planes do you think we can get started in the morning, Steve? Well, Southwest Airlines are asking all our relief pilots to take part in the search. Oh, that's fine. And all of the commercial pilots around the field are going to join in, too. Well, what about the Army? Major Steele's taking care of that. He hopes to get a couple of squadrons assigned to the search. Well, the whole thing sure got me buffaloed. I can't understand Chuck's doing a thing like this. He usually lets someone know where he's going. That's true enough. That's what makes me certain that something very unusual has happened to him. Well, as far as we can tell, he must have taken this kid he met in the lunchroom up for a ride. Yes. I think Chuck took this kid up for a short hop around the field. Then, after he got in the air, something happened which caused him to fly farther away. Well, it must have been something that Chuck saw, either in the air or on the ground. I don't think it could have been anything on the ground. Because if it was, he'd still be near the airport here. Then maybe, maybe it was a plane. Another plane which he saw in the air. He might have followed it. Yes, maybe you've got something there. Why, George, do you suppose... Do you suppose Ivan Shark could be around here somewhere? Well, it's possible. Although I doubt it very much. Well, that would explain everything. If Chuck saw Ivan Shark's plane in the air, he naturally would follow it. And if he did, well, he might be hundreds of miles from here by now. Wait, wait just a second, Steve. If he saw Ivan Shark's plane in the air and started to follow it, he most certainly would radio a report to the field here. If the chase continued, he'd be sending in messages every few minutes. Yeah, I guess you're right. Well, and that theory's out. No, no, wait, not definitely. Chuck's radio might have gone haywire. Oh, that's right. Maybe that's what's happened. Yes, sir. Hello, gentlemen. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Oh, that's all right, Maxwell. Oh, uh, you know Steve Donovan here, don't you? Of course I do. We're old friends. Hello, Steve. Hi, Maxwell. I've known Maxwell for years. What did you find out, Maxwell? I've got 12 ships and pilots lined up in my own hangar. They'll be ready to take off at daybreak. Oh, that's great work. Chuck's had a forced landing anywhere around here. We'll find him by noon. I'll say we will. Between the boys from this hangar and Southwest Airlines, we ought to have about 18 ships in the air. Yes, and that doesn't count the Army planes. Well, boys, I don't see how we can miss. And another thing, the weather looks awfully good. Now, oh, pardon me a minute. Yes, of course. Maxwell talking. Who is it? Oh, why, yes, Hilton. Glad to hear from you. Captain Midnight? Well, he's here in my office right now. Okay, we'll wait for you here. Hilton? Who is he? Oh, I don't think you know him, Steve, but probably Captain Midnight does. Hilton? Oh, well, what's his first name? His first name is Fred. Fred Hilton? Why, of course I know him. Is he working around here now? Yes, he was assigned to some special border work recently. I understand Major Steele knows him, too. He should know him. Well. But what does his Hilton want to see Captain Midnight for? You got me there. Said he had some very important news for Captain Midnight. Important news for me, huh? Well, I wonder what it could be. Well, we'll find out pretty soon. Where was he, Max, when he was talking to you? Well, he's over at the administration building. Should be here any second now. Oh, wait a minute. I think I hear someone outside the door now. 
Well, Fred Hilton, how are you? Awfully <laughs> glad to see you, Captain Midnight. How are you, Maxwell? Fine, Hilton, fine. Oh, uh, meet a friend of mine, Fred, Steve Donovan. He's pilot for Southwest. Oh, I'm glad to know you, Donovan. Pleased to meet you, Hilton. Maxwell says you've got some news for me, Fred. You bet I have plenty. Good. Well, I guess I'd better start at the beginning. Jack Redding, well, you don't know him, Captain Midnight. He's a new man. Mm-hmm. Jack and I have been doing some special work along the border. Yeah, so Maxwell told me. There's been a lot of smuggling going on by plane. And we know the smugglers have been using isolated fields as refueling bases. Mm -hmm. Our instructions were to locate these fields and see if we could break up the gang that way. I understand. Now, go ahead. I was landing at a field quite a ways west of here this morning to pick up Jack when I saw another ship in the air. Naturally, we are rather suspicious of any planes flying around in that desolate country. So I was tickled to death when the pilot landed. Just a minute. What kind of a plane was it? It was a blue-winged, four-passenger cabin job, uh, uh, Moberly. Great Scott, listen to that. What? Oh, that's the plane Chuck was flying. Uh, Just a minute. Uh, What happened, Fred? Was Chuck Ramsey actually flying that plane? (laughs) He most certainly was. I asked to see his pilot's license, and he gave it to me. It had his picture and description on it, and his signature. Mm -hmm. Couldn't be any mistake. Well, we're getting somewhere. Was anyone with him? Yes, yes, there was. Young kid who said his name was, uh, uh, Frank Crane. Oh, now we are getting somewhere. Everything begins to fit together. Uh, well, go on, tell us the rest. Frank Crane, eh? Now, how old a kid is he? About, uh, about Chuck's age, I'd say. Maybe a little bit younger. Well, what were they doing way out there? Naturally, I was suspicious about that. Young Ramsey said they were just out on a joy hop. And that didn't look reasonable to me because it's rather rough country. Rough country wouldn't stop Chuck. <laughs> no, I, I don't think it would. But anyway, young Crane said he told Ramsey it was pretty country out this way, and it is. Although it isn't the kind of country I'd be taking a pleasure hop over. Oh, okay. Uh, what happened next? The moment I didn't think their story held together. And then something else happened, which didn't look good at all. Well, come on, come on. Get to the point. Ramsey was flying an unlicensed plane. Uh-oh. I never thought about that. I did. And I told Chuck as soon as we got here to Ridgeville to report the matter to the Bureau of Air Commerce. Yes, yes. That's what young Ramsey said. He evidently tried to get the inspector here that evening, but the office was closed. But he did report the next morning. Uh I knew Chuck wouldn't fail to do that. Mm, Of course, I didn't believe him, so I put them under arrest. Put put them under arrest? Well, if that isn't one for the books. (laughs) Well, uh, tell me, how did Chuck take that? (laughs) He didn't like it very well, but he took it like a man. (laughs) Well, come on. What happened next, Brett? Well, I questioned him further, and one thing led to another. Finally, your name slipped out. I'll bet that surprised you. (laughs) It sure did. Then he mentioned Connolly and Major Steele, and I... Well, then I knew he was on the level. Yes, he wouldn't know these things if he wasn't. Ramsey was anxious to get back here to the airport because he wanted to go out and see how Connolly was getting along, so I told him to go ahead and take off. I see, and that was the last you saw of him. That's right. Hmm. Then, Fred, you were the last one to see Chuck. Tell me... What time was it you had this conversation with him? Between 9.30 and 10 o'clock this morning. What time did he take off to come back here? Oh, I'd say, uh, I'd say it was about 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. Where is this field, Fred? It's west of here, about 75 miles. Hmm. Well then, Captain, all we've got to do is search the country between here and that field 75 miles away. Yes. Hmm. I wonder who's coming in now. Come in. Could I speak to the manager? Well, I'm the manager, ma'am. Uh, what can I do for you? I- I'm looking for my boy. Your boy? Uh, who are you? My name's Crane, sir. Miss Lewis Crane. Mrs. Crane? What is your boy's first name, Mrs. Crane? His name's Frank, sir. And he should have been home long ago. Well, when did you see your boy last, Mrs. Crane? I saw Frank this morning when he left for the field. He's just crazy about flying, and he's been taking flying lessons. That is when we could spare the money. I understand, Mrs. Crane. And that was, you say... Early this morning? Yes, it was early this morning, but I did see him later than that. Later than that? Well, tell us about it. He flew over the house about 8.30, and he dived down, and he waved at me. Hmm. Could you tell us the kind of a plane he was in? Well, all I know is it had blue wings. Blue wings. It all fits in. Young Crane said that he had flown over his home. After that, they started out west. Please, sir, what are you talking about? Do you know what's happened? What's happened to my Frank? Well, I'm afraid, Mrs. Crane, I can't tell you definitely about that yet. However, Oh, but I... please, you do know something. I can tell by the way you talk. You, you must have seen Frank, and you must have talked to him. Oh, please, please tell me what's happened to him. I beg of you, Mrs. Crane. Now, please compose yourself. There's no reason at all to suppose that any harm has happened to your boy. But, but I, I don't understand. You gentlemen know something about Frank. I know you must. Now, just one moment, Mrs. Crane, while I explain. Something's happened to Frank. I'm sure it is. Mrs. Crane, you mustn't go on like that. I assure you that, well, as far as we know, 
Nothing has happened to your boy. You're sure? You're sure nothing has happened to him? I... I said, Mrs. Crane, as far as we know. But I don't understand just what has happened. Where's Frank gone and why hasn't he come back? Just a moment, please. Now, I'll try to explain everything to you. You see, your son met a young friend of mine. A boy by the name of Chuck Ramsey. Now, I'm as fond of Chuck as you are of your boy. Well, your boy, Frank, met Chuck this morning while they were having breakfast together at the airport lunchroom. All we know is that they got to talking about flying, and Chuck offered to take Frank for a ride. They flew north from the airport, dived down over your home, and your boy waved to them. Yes, yes, I was out in the yard. Then they flew west, and later, seeing a plane on a field about 75 miles from here, they landed. The plane they saw was flown by Mr. Hilton here, whom you heard mention Frank's name. You, you talked to him, didn't you, Mr. Hilton? Yes, yes, I did, Mrs. Crane. He was all right then. Then, after talking to Mr. Hilton, the two boys got into Chuck's plane and took off for the airport here. Well, they didn't arrive. Yes, uh, yes, go on. But that's nothing to be alarmed about. Because they may have had a forced landing due to engine trouble and haven't been able to get to a telephone to report themselves. But I assure you, Mrs. Crane, we will find your boy and return him to you. Oh, thank you. We've got to find both him and Chuck Ramsey. But will finding young Frank Crane and Chuck Ramsey be as easy as all that? Little does Captain Midnight realize that there will be many days of anxiety and suspense before he even knows that Chuck is alive. Thrilling developments are ahead. Don't miss them. Tune in to Captain Midnight. Be sure to tune in our next program for a very important announcement that you'll be thrilled to hear. And tell all your friends to listen in, too, for sure. So don't forget to tune in again Wednesday, same time, same station, for further transcribed adventures of Captain Midnight, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday by the Skelly Oil Company, Skelly Jobbers, and Dealers. Until Wednesday, this is Don Gordon, your Skelly Man, saying goodbye and happy landing! <laughs> Going back to February 19th, 1940, Captain Midnight here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thank you so much for making us a part of your day. Would you please thank this radio station and support their advertisers? Their kindness and courtesy allows us to be with you each and every time we roll around. Uh, thank them both, won't you please, and do business with them when you can. Uh, our website is classicradio.stream. There you can stream our shows on demand. You can learn more about classic radio collecting. You can also contact me there. That web page again is classicradio.stream. Classicradio.stream. If you miss a day on this station, you do not have to miss a single show. Our programs are available anywhere on the internet. The podcasts are served, including iHeartRadio, including Spotify, Spreaker, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, also through the Audible app. Uh, all over the place, just search for Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. That's Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Have yourself a great day, won't you please? And do me a huge favor and tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.